On Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast, I'm your host, Dr. Ellie Berlin, with today's co-host, chiropractor, doula, wife, and mother, Kristen Palacy. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Always great to have you here. You have such good insight. Today's topic, Kristen, is a direct response from requests from listeners. So if you have a request, send it to us. We'll actually do an episode on your request and address your questions or topics. Today we'll be discussing breastfeeding basics in our first episode ever on lactation and nursing. In the first half, we'll discuss helpful tips on how to prepare your mind, body, and home for breastfeeding. And in the second half, we'll discuss some early troubleshooting and common issues that come up. We have two guests in the studio today. I originally met a Nisha, when she was pregnant, getting ready for birth, and then was honored to support her with body work during her labor and delivery. We bonded. We did. We've become friends, and she's helped shape the content of several episodes of our podcast and our YouTube series, The Real Midwives of Los Angeles. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Our expert in the studio today is a lactation superhero. <laughs> She's Thank your you. lactation superhero and many other people's lactation superhero. And you even have, she even has her own version of the Batmobile, <laughs> which we'll talk about soon. She's an award winning maternal and child health nurse, an internationally board certified lactation consultant, and the founder of My Nursing Coach. Over the past 30 years, she has developed mother baby health care and educational programs for top ranking hospitals. Thousands of mothers have been inspired to breastfeed through her support groups, classes, and private lactation consultations. Linda Hanna, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. You are a superhero in terms of lactation. I mean, when especially when things are not going well, you need to have a superhero, and that's how people describe you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we, <laughs> we'd like to talk about many of our listeners are pregnant. Many of them are hoping or planning to breastfeed and, um, don't know where to start. Um, on one level, you see the other animals do it without taking a class or watching a video or reading a book. Um, and then on the other level, you see sometimes people get into it and feel like they were underprepared. So how do you get a good, a sense of what to do and what you need to know before you get started so that you can start on the right foot? Well, I think that's a great question, and I would love to share a funny little comment about the animals because they don't actually know what they're doing either sometimes. Oh, good. Uh, this is why they have helpers <laughs> at the zoo. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's very important for everybody to know that that 99% of the time, everybody can breastfeed. Not everybody has enough breast milk. Mm -hmm. That is a big issue. We talk about this a lot with our patients and our moms. Uh, not everybody has a full complement of breast milk, but 99% of the time, the mother can actually breastfeed. It's just deciding what breastfeeding means for them. And sometimes we have to include pumping and providing breast milk back for babies. Sometimes mothers have to use supplementary feedings of either a donor milk or milk bank milk or even sometimes formula in some cases. But everybody should plan on breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. They may not always start out exactly with the plan that they had envisioned in their you know, fantasies of how the birth is going to go and how the breastfeeding is going to go. But there are enough support people around to help women guided to the right end result, which is I want to nurse my baby and I want it to be my way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we help them do. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, uh, breast milk is the gold standard in, in infant nutrition. So if you can, it's great to be able to, um, to breastfeed. I think there are some reasons why physiologically people either can't or don't. And also sometimes uh, other reasons, more psychological reasons where they just don't feel like it's something that they want to do. Right. Uh, but for women who choose to and want to, it's great to know that, I mean, you sound very positive, like almost everybody can. Everybody we know at least tries, and they they breastfeed, and how they define it is up to them. Mm -hmm. but we're going to give them the tools that they need to latch their baby on correctly and to not be doing this with pain and to have to suffer through a breastfeeding experience that doesn't feel pleasant for them, but make it enjoyable, and then fill in all the blanks with all the things that they need so that they can either pump and provide breast milk or just exclusively breastfeed their baby. But let's talk a little bit about what you asked first, which is how do you get started? How do you get started? Yeah, what people need to know. What do moms need to know and dads need to know and support family members need to know or partners need to know? And that is that you have to know who's going to be with you, supporting you, guiding you and loving you when you go to the hospital or have your baby at home with your midwife or your doulas with you. And what is everybody's role going to be? And we want people around you who are going to be loving and kind and supportive and not say anything mean to you. So one of the biggest things for me is to have people around you who remind you every day how well you're doing and how well your baby's doing and how positive things could be instead of the 
negative things like your nipples are too small or your breasts are the wrong shape or anything like that. Regardless of the shape of the nipples or the breasts, the mother's going to still breast. The baby belongs to her mother. Mm -hmm. And so that set naturally just goes together. And we could work our way through all the different little subtle things that might be happening. But knowing your doctor supports you, knowing your pediatrician or your midwife supports you and your doula supports you, that is number one. Get the team around you. We believe in a big team approach. Get the team around you who are going to care for you and love you and guide you for however long your journey is going to be, whether it's going to be a week of breastfeeding, a month or a year or two or more. That you need the people around you. And then you need your partnership. So whoever's with you to help you, whether that's your wife, your husband, your mom, your aunt, whoever is going to be with you to say kind words in, in a kind way so that the mother feels lifted and she feels positive. Then you need all your stuff. And my rule is you kind of don't really need anything and your baby in arm's reach. But moms want to know and dads want to know what should we get to start? Mm -hmm. And the answer really is the simplest thing I could say is you need to have a, at least a small kind of area of your house in your space where you can sit calmly and comfortably without a lot of without a lot of interference a sort of dim light and a comfortable chair moms and dads like to think about a pillow uh, maybe that's something that they can use to support themselves we want the mother to be comfortable when she's breastfeeding that may require some support a chair a couch a bench or a stool that she can put her feet up on and get her back and shoulders and neck comfortable and you guys know that, especially because you know the mm -hmm. body mechanics are so vital. Otherwise, the moms often will say, my shoulders hurt, my neck hurts, I, I need a massage, I need a, a body work, because they're just sitting so awkwardly when they're breastfeeding. So comfort is key. And then the most important part is having a baby who's ready for a feeding and not trying to feed the baby at times where the baby's not really interested, which might to the mother seem like the baby doesn't want me mm. or the baby doesn't like this or the baby isn't nursing well, but maybe it wasn't the right time. Mm. So teaching parents the cues, learning what to look for, and then to be comfortable so that they can actually bring the baby to the breast and the baby is ready for feeding. So are that's there, starting. Uh, are there like paraphernalia, breastfeeding paraphernalia kind of things that you need to have? So then in making a list for new parents when they're going out shopping, we always say to them ahead of time, think about what you might need at home. For example, we recommend everybody have a sipper bottle, a water bottle, or a canteen that they can have with them, a little basket so they can make little nuts and seeds and almonds and cashew bags or little snack bags or treat bags for themselves so that they have food right in their hands reach or arms reach. Also, some supplies for the baby so that they can change a diaper right there. They don't have to keep getting up and down, but make it a very safe and comfortable place to sit with your baby. Also, that breastfeeding support like a, a little bench for their feet or mm. a little step stool and a nursing pillow if they like or a shoulder and back pillow. We also recommend making sure they have comfortable garments to wear. Oftentimes I'll tell my mommies, you know what, your shirt is getting in the way, put it up over your head or don't wear a shirt that's got a zipper so that the baby's face isn't being, you know, poked at by a zipper. So make yourself comfortable, wear a comfortable fitting bra and a comfortable fitting top that you can mm. then expose yourself comfortably so that the baby's close to you. You'll often hear a lot of people talking about skin to skin. It's a big, big thing. There's so much education on skin to skin. It really matters if the baby and the mother are close. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that there's nothing getting in the way of their relationship, of the baby being close. So oftentimes I'll say, you know, wear as little as possible, but wear what's comfortable. We don't want the mothers to feel exposed unnecessarily or feel cold. We want them to stay warm when they're nursing. But there are ways that they can be comfortable and also not be completely disrobed. And if they have family or friends over, they might not want to be sitting there. Or even in a hospital setting, people are in and out of their room. So a comfortable garment for breastfeeding in is essential, whether it's a pajama top or a comfortable bra or a comfortable shirt. Can you buy a postpartum bra during pregnancy? I think that's a good idea to go looking around and having someone fit you who knows how to fit a maternity type bra. And yes, you can wear a nursing bra the last four to six weeks of the pregnancy and be very comfortable. Mommies will often like to get other paraphernalia like nursing pads. There's a lot of cotton washable pads. Some of the mommies like to wear 
a little paper pad. We highly recommend a coconut butter base or almond butter or extra virgin olive oil based nipple butter cream, Mm -hmm. which is very soothing and very comforting for them for their skin, which can get chafed and dry. So that's something they might want to have in their nursing paraphernalia bag as well. And then there are a lot of things, which I don't think is a this is a good environment to talk about all of the things that you might need if something might not go right. Mm -hmm. But just to know, there are tricks and tips for everything. Good. Every problem has a solution. I think we'll talk about some of those in the second half. Definitely. Of our podcast. What about classes? Do you recommend that they take a class before? So breastfeeding classes are important for some people. They feel that they need to get as much information and book knowledge as they can before they actually go to the event of the birth. Mm -hmm. Some people feel that they didn't get enough out of a breastfeeding class because they don't have an actual baby to latch on. Although in breastfeeding classes, we often teach with a doll demonstration. Mm -hmm. I think knowledge is power, and the more information parents have when they're bringing a new baby home is better. But some people will find that the class might not have been as uh, vital for them. They could have read. Some people prefer reading. Some people like to listen and learn. And some people like to watch. So I would say, yes, a breastfeeding class could be very valuable and very helpful. But I also think it's important to read and to ask questions, and most importantly, to talk to your provider, midwife or doctor, and your pediatrician about what their expectations are and match them up with your expectations. Linda, is there a specific book or a series of books that you recommend? Well, I do think that there are a lot of very, very good informational, educational books out in the, in the market, in the bookstores. I also think there's a lot of online information. Uh, for example, our site, we have a tremendous educational library on our site, our website, and patients are always welcome. Parents are always welcome to read up on our website. What's your website? Our site is um, mynursingcoach.com. But also, we also have an app called Mummy, M-A-H-M-E-E, which is a tremendous educational bank. But and it's it, an app. And it's an app. It's a web-based app. Oh, it's a but web app. But more importantly, there are tremendous books. Sheila Kitzinger's book is an excellent book on breastfeeding basics. Diane West has a wonderful book on milk production. Hilary Jacobson writes a wonderful book on mother food, nutritional information and balance for pregnancy, postpartum, and breastfeeding. There's a tremendous amount of literature out there on the bookshelves, in the bookstores, and also online. I think parents should do some homework and read up and find out what they need to know so that their breastfeeding experience is a positive one for them. That's great. Um, We have two mommies here uh, who are just about a year uh, for both of you. Yes. Yeah. And so I'm curious what you guys did to prepare and if you felt prepared enough or if there are things looking back that you would have done differently beforehand to be better prepared. So I did the whole array of classes. I did classes left and right. Um, and I, from my personal experience, I feel like where I got the most was on the job training. That's how it really kind of um, – narrowed out for me. But one of the arenas where I particularly felt that we could have used some help was uh, that in between of uh, after I've had after we had the baby, we were in the room and there's lactation consultants coming constantly in and out. And it wasn't necessarily synced up with the time that the baby needed to feed. Um, So one of the things that I wish we had had a little bit more help with was how to navigate uh, better, the best way to utilize lactation consultants while you're in the hospital and when you're in that specific arena. And what we had found was that we could actually call and reserve a time for them, which worked out being better. For your hospital consultant? Yes. Yeah. All right, as an independent consultant, Linda, can you go to the hospital and do consults with brand new moms? Many, many hospitals allow lactation consultants to come from the outside. Mm-hmm. But there are also hospitals who do not have outside consultants coming in because of the hospital policies. And we prefer actually to have the patients utilize the support services that are available in the medical center that that they're having their ba- baby in birth at or at the midwives um, at the birth centers because they have a specific style and type of care that they provide inpatient. And because you can't chart when you're not a provider for in the medical oh, center, there's no documentation. So that sometimes can be a fine line. I always recommend utilizing the services and staff that are there. But in regards to Anisha's question and her response to what could have a lactation consultant in a hospital have provided and what do parents need to know so that they can utilize that, that support 
support staff Mm -hmm. to the best of their ability. The answer is you're right. We can't always time it. Babies feed erratically in the first few days. So the lactation consultant may show up and your baby just fed a half an hour ago. And if you can negotiate and ask them, could you come back in two hours or can I call you? That's ideal. And I ask parents to do the same thing that she did. Ask for somebody to come in when you need them. Right. Coming in after the baby ate may not be of 100% value. There'll still be value in the visit. The lactation consultant will talk and answer questions. But the actual touch, hands-on, latching a baby, you need somebody physically there with you when your baby's ready for a feeding. That makes sense. 43 years old, I'm still eating erratically. (laughs) Isn't that the craziest thing? Erratic feeding. Eating 24-7. Yeah. (laughs) One of the things that's very important to talk about with the inpatient lactation consulting services that I would like people to know is your lactation support in the hospital is to guide the baby's initial feedings, but that many, many times people go home, and that's when they start identifying other issues that present. So the baby latch is fine in the hospital. Everything seems fine, but the mother hasn't developed a full milk supply yet, and so then they go home, and like. I don't know what I'm doing. My baby's not latching now or my milk is coming in. It's harder to latch or it's not as hard to latch. So I think good ongoing support is vital for parents, Mm -hmm. not just the hospital support, but ongoing after that as well. Which is from private. Reaching out. Not necessarily private, actually. Oh, peer-to-peer? Either through, for example, a a support group situation where many parents go. Some doctor's offices provide lactation support after the mother goes home so the baby can come back into the pediatrician's office or the um, even sometimes an OB office, but mostly pediatrician's offices. And, and the parents can get help. Parents can get help at home. Some people go to the uh, department uh, WIC, which is Women, Infant, and Children, so that they can get help through the county organization, a very valuable resource. Some hospital centers provide ongoing support after the moms and dads go home. So parents need to do the homework and research and find out what services are available for us, what is covered by my insurance, what am I going to have to pay out of pocket, what is provided by my health care organization. That's really cool. And then also in the second half, we'll talk about when to call for for that type of help. Um, Kristen, what about you? How did you get ready for breastfeeding? Uh, I took classes in hospital also, um, I and uh, that was really helpful. I think the, like learning the positions, practicing them with your partner, that was really good for us because I wasn't going to remember them. So it was nice to have that help after and that he could remember like, oh, m- maybe you have the chin come first. I'm like, oh, yeah, OK, because <laughs> I was so tired. But I had a, <laughs> Were there a lot of partners in your class. Yes, hmm. there was pretty much every every group had either one or their partner and support person. Mm-hmm. So that was interesting also. So the doula came uh, cool, to the yeah. class as well, which I've never right. seen. So that was really cool. Um, but I had a unique um, kind of transition because I started out in a birthing center and um, then I had a really hard labor. So I got transitioned to the hospital. So because I was there and had my baby in the hospital, um, I was still under the care of the midwife in that hospital because um, the midwife had rights there. Yeah, she has privileges so, there. Yeah, so um, they kind of left me alone. So I didn't actually then have anyone come and check on me mm. uh, or see how that went. So then when she checked on me the next day is the only next time I had somebody come and ask me if I needed any mm-hmm. help. Luckily, I had a really good partner who came to the classes <laughs> with me. So our like uh, uh, Linda had mentioned, so our in-hospital time was good. I didn't have really any problems until I went home and started getting like a supply mm-hmm. of milk. So other than that, it was kind of unique, I think. I would love to back up for a second and find out how you became you. You're so passionate and knowledgeable, and you've helped and saved so many people. How did you get into this? How did I get into this is kind of crazy, but I'm actually a nurse, and I've been a nurse for a long time. And when I was working in labor and delivery, the babies were being born, and the mommies wanted to breastfeed. And I thought, well, I better help them, I think, because I was kind of radical And I didn't want the babies to go to the nursery. I had a terrible reputation at the hospital of being the nurse who kept the babies back. And then the nursery nurses back in those old days got very upset with me. The babies would be cold or I'd say, how could they be cold? They're with their mother. So I took it upon myself to become a lactation educator. Back in the old days when I was doing this training, uh, there wasn't a consultant yet. It hadn't actually, the field hadn't actually been born yet. And so I became- (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I um, became a lactation educator, and I started teaching and training and doing those things. And then at my work, I was able to do a lot of lactation support for parents. And then I 
kind of felt like we should really be doing more of this. And I started to develop lactation programs for hospitals around the city and now um, around the country. And it was mostly because of my connection with the mothers. I wanted them to feel that they could do what they wanted to do with their babies. And that was most at that time in the early 80s was breastfeed. So it sort of followed a natural path to my labor and delivery nursing work that the baby would come out and then go on the breast. As time went by, I started realizing that we would take care of these mothers very well in the hospital, and then we sent them home, and we sent them home, and they didn't know what they were doing all the time. So I started, like many other companies around the country, a lactation education and support program outpatient, and I ran a little lactation center, and then a store eventually developed, a brick and mortar. And after that, I felt like I should keep going and keep going, and out of that came my my now my new business, which is my nursing coach, I have been back and forth to the hospital for the past 40 years. And I felt that there's still a missing piece. The missing piece is making sure that the mothers are getting the care and the attention and support. So it's very important for me to say at this point right now that breastfeeding is important. Yes, I have a passion about it. Uh, but really, my, my actual real intention is to care for mothers. Mm-hmm. I'm an OB nurse. I'm not a baby nurse. I don't take care of babies. They're very cute. I love them. (laughs) But I don't really do babies. I do mothers. And I think that from the mother's point of view, we're often not paying attention to all of her needs, her physical, emotional, psychological, sexual, and home needs. And that's my goal. My goal was always to just step in and say, "We we can fix this part. The breastfeeding's easy. Can you run a home and some other children, and a partner, a husband, a wife, a friend, whatever, and also be the best you. And so that was my original goal, was just to help the mothers get back to themselves again and not feel lost in the babiness. Because it's overwhelming at times. You have Mm -hmm. a baby, and I I don't know what to do with you. How do I entertain you all day? What do I do with you? So I felt like my my real calling was nurturing the mother. Mm -hmm. And out of it just came this thing, and, and breastfeeding came, and my hands are very good at that. So... I just wanted to do that. And, but mostly I love teaching. So my goal is to get as many people as I can under my belt and the other people who do what I do so that we can grow the, the actual field of lactation more than it is. There's not that many of us. People who are in this industry know it's hard to get help. There's not a lot of us. We need to develop more. And so the International Board of Lactation Consultants is working very hard to get people through the training and get them out into the community and get women help as, as early and for as long as possible. When did you get the Batmobile? So that's a very sweet story. I'm going to take a minute to tell you because sure. I think it's important to know. Uh, I came home one day from work very frustrated. I often did that. And my <laughs> wonderful, adorable husband, Stephen, who recently passed away, he mm-hmm. came home one day and said, I know you're really upset and you want to get out to the moms and you can't get out to the moms, so I bought something for you. And I said, I hope you didn't buy me anything that actually has wheels. And he said, I did. And he came home with a 24-foot Winnebago Rialto coach, wow. a la the nursing coach. That's where the name actually came from. Oh, coach. My husband gutted out a Winnebago. My ex-husband actually helped him. And mm-hmm. they made it into a mobile office store. So everything that you possibly could have needed for breastfeeding was on the truck. And the parents would come into the truck and do the visit with me in the truck. I have rocker and glider. I had all of the supplies. And I had air conditioning and heating and water bottles and for everything they needed. And I would drive to their home and pull up in front of their house. Hi, I'm here. Bring the baby out. And we would do the visit in the truck. About five years ago, four and a half years ago, the traffic in Los Angeles got so ridiculous Mm -hmm. that I had to abandon the truck. Mm -hmm. And my husband came home and said, that's okay. I found a miniature version of it for you. (laughs) (laughs) So we drive, my girls and I drive around the city in little Ford Transit Connects, which are also mobile stores. That's why we are the mobile lactation center. We will go to you, bring everything you need, what we know you need, the things that we think would be very beneficial, and then come do what we need to do, and leave. But the key, which is what Anisha and, I, Anisha and I were talking about earlier, is the key is providing ongoing support and attention after the visit. The mm-hmm. visit is easy, and you all know that. Everybody knows that. We can get the baby to nurse. We can figure out what you do with your pump. We can help you, guide you, direct you. But who is going to be there for you after this visit and for that period of time, 12 months, 15 months, a year or two or three, while you're nursing, while you're working, while you're pumping, and provide guidance and support ongoing? 
By the way, the other piece which is vital is making sure that the mother maintains her mental health and wellness. And you know that better than anybody, Mm -hmm. as I made a referral this morning even to Dr. Berlin, the other Dr. Berlin. Yeah, because women need help and support and guidance, and it's not in one-stop shopping. Mm -hmm. It's over time. Things happen during the first year. Women need guidance and support, and our job is to make sure they have all those arm reach and everything around them so that they can get the support and guidance that they need. Not just the breastfeeding one time, one visit, but always questions, Mm -hmm. calls, things like that. All right. Um, I'm learning a lot. Me too. I almost feel like I'm ready to try it, but uh, (laughs) I'm not. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back with Linda Hanna and Anisha and Kristen for more Breastfeeding Basics on the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. We're continuing our discussion of breastfeeding basics with Linda, Hannah, and Kristen, and Anisha. Welcome back. Um, A question that I get from moms before they have the baby oftentimes is, will I be able to, will I not be able to breastfeed because of X, Y, or Z? Uh, For example, breast augmentation, breast reduction, breast too big, too small, uh, inverted nipples. How do you address those questions? That's a wonderful question. And of course, moms are very concerned about that. Most of the time, well, first of all, let me remind you again, there isn't a baby that can't latch on Mm -hmm. unless there's something anatomically wrong, physiologically wrong with the baby. The baby's been separated from the mother from medical conditions, or in some cases, oral motor issues. Sometimes there's a birth injury, a birth trauma, or birth work that needs to be done, and the baby's not functioning at 100%. Or maybe in some cases, this is a a new word. People are hearing a lot about phrenotomy. Babies Mm -hmm. have a little frenulum or tongue tie or a lip tie that can interfere with some 100% successfulness, although that is resolvable with a physician referral and the right care through a dentist or an ENT doctor that can be resolved. And with some birth work or after birth work, the baby can be uh, repositioned and the head can be realigned and the spine, etc. So we know that the babies and the mothers can get body work done after the fact. But let's go back to that original question. Breast implants, reduction surgeries, most of the time do not interfere with a mother's ability to breastfeed her baby. Remember what I said earlier, milk supply and baby's breastfeeding ability are not the same. The baby can latch on. Whether or not the mother has enough milk or not, we won't know right away. We'll Make sure that we try to find out early how the milk supply is responding after the baby's been nursing or the mother's been pumping. But they'll all latch on. And then we'll work on, as time goes by, whether or not the implants, which usually don't cause any problems, are causing any issues, or if a reduction might have reduced some of the mammary tissue that's milk making, and maybe there's not as much that was maybe there before. So we don't want anybody to come into this thinking, well, my surgery might interfere. Think nothing's going to interfere. Maybe our hands will get in the way. That's the worst thing that happens is too many people put their hands in everything. And that if the mother and the baby can be united as quickly as possible after the delivery and we use the golden hour, it's a big deal now to have the baby with the parents, then the chances are that the baby will latch on fairly quickly after birth. Again, considering a stressed baby, a cold baby, a baby with a birth trauma or a difficult delivery, or a baby that's been taken away from the mother early for medical problems, whether the mother or the baby had a medical problem, keeping those in mind, everybody else should expect to latch their baby on fairly shortly after the birth, and then ongoing as time goes by for the next 24 to 48 hours in a hospital, in a birth center, or at home. Okay. Um, What about inverted nipples? Let's talk a little bit about nipples. So everybody has different nipples. And thank God the baby knows exactly which mother it belongs to and goes right to those nipples. Uh, The good news is most of the time the nipples don't interfere with breastfeeding. It is possible that a somewhat of inverted nipple could make it a little bit more tricky for a baby to latch on. But then we'll pull out all the tricks and tools. There's a nipple inverter 
everter that if an inverted nipple exists, that we can use a little suction cup to pull it out. There are nipple shields that moms will often use, sometimes just a little nipple rolling technique from the mother prior to trying to nurse her baby can draw the nipple out a little bit. And unbelievably, by golly, some babies can latch onto an inverted nipple because they're not actually latching onto a nipple. Remember, they're latching onto a breast. Mm -hmm. So they get their mouth and tongue in the right place, and then the nipple draws out. One of the dilemmas that women face after they have breastfed a baby with a slightly inverted nipple or a fully inverted nipple is the discomfort. The nipple's been shy for 32, 35, 40 years, and all of a sudden there's a baby with 60 pounds per square inch of pressure in their little jaw. Mm. They'll suck that little (laughs) nipple right out and often tear some of the skin. And also remember, it's inverted because it's got connective tissue band behind it. Mm -hmm. So that band is being stretched. So Oftentimes when women have a pregnancy and they know they've had inverted nipples their entire life, they'll often do some prenatal exercise and work, even a little tiny bit of pumping or nipple rolling to help it evert so that when the baby's born, they at least have some stretch and some give to the connective tissue. And then what I always tell my mommies is, don't let the baby be the one that makes your nipple hurt. You do the little nipple rolling first, so that way you're the one causing your own pain. (laughs) And then when the baby goes on, you're not like, oh my God, the baby hurt me. The baby didn't mean to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just that the nipple's getting stretched. It's new skin. When someone latches for the first time, what can they expect? Again, a wonderful question. Most of the time, it's a romantic, delicious, and amazing. And the moms generally say, this is really good. This feels really good. Sometimes it's a little bit uncomfortable. Some women aren't used to that sensation. It's a new sensation. There are many women who report, my nipples are always sensitive. They're sensitive now even more. During pregnancy, they become very sensitive. And for some women, it's not a pleasant experience. It's just like, I can feel the baby there. It's a little annoying, but then they kind of soften into it and the oxytocin and prolactin hormones start working and the mommy becomes calm and more relaxed and the feeding is much more joyful. But we can expect that you're going to need a little help first getting started. Many, many times the baby is born and put right back onto the mother's breast and chest area. And the baby often can sneak and find their way to the nipple by sense of smell Mm -hmm. and they'll latch on themselves. A lot of women need help. So my recommendation is ask for help. Don't wait till somebody comes around 24 hours later, 36 hours later. You can say to your labor and birth nurse or your midwife or your doula, especially the doulas are all trained, can you help me guide the baby to the breast or help me position myself so that I'm comfortable and then allow the baby to latch on? Then the next couple of visits back to the breast, you're going to tweak and move and reposition so that the baby and the mother are both comfortable. And I suggest... If you're lucky enough to have a partner who watched in the class and paid attention, (laughs) ask them to help you. If not, say, I'm here in a hospital and all of you are actually OB nurses and doulas and midwives who do this. Please help guide me. Don't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. We don't want you to get sore. If you're sore on the first day, then the second day is going to be worse and you don't have to be sore. As the journey unfolds, what are some of the more common issues or roadblocks that people run into? That's a wonderful question, too, because I'd like to spend a minute talking about that. So after the initial breastfeeding, the baby goes to sleep. And so they come out of the birth, and most of the time, whether they're born by cesarean or by vaginal delivery or by an assisted vacuum, the baby comes out and wants to nurse. They have those wonderful two or three hours of awake time, and then they go to sleep. And they're in recovery mode quiet and calm, and they don't want to nurse for up to even six hours. So don't feel pressured to rush and feed the baby again every two hours if the baby doesn't seem ready. Let's wait until the baby wakes up. They're born with enough most of the time to live off the fat of the land, and they can sustain on their own body fluid for a good four to six or 10 hours. Then they'll want to come to the breast often. And our suggestion is you nurse the baby as often as the baby wants to come to the breast and expect about 12 to 15 or 18 minutes of suckling time about every one and a half to two or three hours. And unfortunately, mommies, that's day and night. Mm. And the nights are often harder because babies are nocturnal for 40 days. That means they're awake in the night and they sleep in the day. And we count 40 days from their due date. So if you had a baby a little early, you've got to get to the due date in 40 more days for them to be more awake in the day and less awake in the night. Hmm. The good news is it doesn't matter. You're awake in the night too because you're getting up to go pee-pee a lot and you're turning and you're moving and we're checking on you often. So breastfeeding often in the early days helps initiate the prolactin response and the milk supply to come in on time. And time is three to five or six days. For the milk to come in? For the full milk supply to come in. So what's happening in the first two to three days? The baby's nursing and 
mostly colostrum. Sometimes some moms get their milk in very early, two or three days. Mm -hmm. But for the first two to five days, the baby's nursing on the most essential nutrition, which is colostrum. And there's plenty of it available for the baby. You, you make more? As the days go by, the mummies make more. Generally speaking, most women can produce about an ounce of colostrum every hour or so, in sometimes as, much as, as little as a teaspoon, as much as up to 30 milliliters, which is one fluid ounce. But the babies generally take between one and two teaspoons of breast milk in the first 24 to 48 hours of life. It's a very you, small how, amount. During that time, I, I imagine it's nerve-wracking. Like, how do you know you're giving enough? Well, and that's a very important question. More importantly than the first day or two is the first week or two. How do you know you're mm -hmm. making enough for the baby? Trust us to tell you that if we're concerned about the baby's intake, for example, the baby might not be getting as much as a teaspoon or two, trust that the baby is going to sustain the first day or two on their birth fluid. They're born with a little bit more volume than they actually need for living which is why they lose up to 10 or 11% of their birth weight in the first 24 to 36 hours of life. And they, even as much as up to the first five days of life, can lose weight. Then as the milk comes in more and more every day, their weight starts to go back up. Mm -hmm. So we expect the baby to have a small amount of urine output and a small amount of poopy diapers. Meconium is the first stool, and they'll have that for the first two or three days. Then after the third day, the breast milk starts to change to transitional milk, and the baby's poo, poo starts to change to greener, lighter, thinner, more watery consistency that matches the mother's milk. By the time the mother's milk's coming in more fully on day four, five, six, the baby's poops start to change to a more yellow, seedy consistency that matches the mother's breast milk. So they're actually timed mm. to cross on time. And by the time the mother's milk supply is in complementary, the baby starts to gain back some of their weight. So we expect the babies to lose weight. We know they're going to lose weight. We expect the babies to have fairly low output on the first, second, and third day of life and have increasing output on the fourth, fifth, and sixth day of life. Those are the signs that you know, as a parent, your babies are getting enough. What would be a sign that you're not getting enough? A very good sign of the baby not getting enough liquid would be no output. If mm -hmm. the baby's not peeing or pooping in the second 24 hours of life or the third 24 hours of life, so we're on day two or three and the baby has less output, we'd expect it to be going up by now. Remember, right. they'd have lost some of their weight and their urine output on the first day or two, and then the mother's milk is starting to change and go up. So the urine output and, and the bowel movement should be going up as well. So that would be a sign. The other sign would be a very fussy, irritable baby who doesn't seem satiated. Most of the time when they're nursing in the first 48 hours, they're very contented after feeding. They'll nurse 10, 12, 15, 18 minutes, sometimes 40 minutes, and then they'll seem quiet, calm, and satiated. Mm -hmm. And as the milk is flowing more and more, they'll be more contented after each feeding. So we'll ask the parents on upon discharge to watch for some key things. Make sure your baby's having wet and dirty diapers. Count them for us. Make sure your baby's sleeping solidly for at least an hour or two, two or three times in a 24-hour day, not fussing and irritable all the time, and actually calling you, saying, I'm hungry over here, and asking for food. You shouldn't have to be waking your baby all of the time, every single time the baby needs to feed. The baby should be asking for some food and nutrition as well. Is it normal for that early latching and feeding to be painful? Some women will have some pain with latching. We just described that for moms who have inverted nipples, for moms who are not careful or have support early on, they're not latching correctly. The baby needs to have a deep enough, wide enough, uh, gaping, opening mouth and the tongue position properly to pass the nipple and beyond the areola tissue deep onto the breast so that the mother's not having pain. But there are absolutely reasons why women experience postpartum breast pain and or nipple pain, and that should be addressed very early on postpartum with lactation support in the hospital or as soon as you get home. But if you go home a day after you have the baby and you're sort of on your own, you don't really have the village around you, um, is there a way to discern what's normal, just learning curve soreness versus something that's less normal? I like to um, answer that question with a question that I ask patients and I'll ask mothers. And even in the hospital, the nurses will ask patients as well. What's your pain score? Mm -hmm. Breastfeeding has a pain score of zero or one. On the pain score of one to 10, 10 is very high. The initial latch with a newborn baby will often will tell moms, you'll feel something. It might even feel like a 10 or an 11 for about 10 seconds. That's because it's a new discomfort, a new sensation. Cracked, bleeding, sore nipples that sustain a pain score above two or three 
is generally a poor latch, not a deep latch, or a baby with some kind of anatomical issue that we should really check into. You shouldn't be cracked and bleeding. Breastfeeding doesn't actually hurt. Mm -hmm. It's a calming, soothing, relaxing feeling most of the time, unless the baby's not on correctly, or we have some anatomy issue, which we just described, or some oral issue that, and maybe even something even bigger than that, like, for example, asynclitic head or torticollis or something causing the baby not to be going on straight, that they're turning their head or pulling the nipple teat at an angle that causes this pain for the mother. So what I like to say to my mommies is, if you need a Percocet, we need to fix something here. Mm -hmm. Because if your pain score is above a five or a six, we would be offering you in the hospital pain medication. We need to fix this. Breastfeeding shouldn't hurt. And we advise people to get help soon, get help early, ask questions, and let's treat the situation as quickly and as early as possible. It doesn't always require a lactation visit. Sometimes it's something simple we could describe over the phone. Sometimes we can do it virtually or visually with a app, a Skype call, or even a FaceTime and make some adjustments. I remember the first time I ran a 10K on the treadmill because I was working up to it. I did 5K, then eventually I did the first time I did 10K. I came upstairs and I went to shower and my nipples were so painful. And I didn't know this happened because it's the first time I was really ever active in my whole life. You get like chafing from the shirt. Yes. It was so painful. I was like, honey, where do we keep the nipple butter? <laughs> and it was so helpful. <laughs> it's crazy, me. isn't that crazy? It's a crazy? totally random, unrelated story, but that's the closest I'll ever come to knowing. Well, I will be honest with you. If women are describing any kind of discomfort, we, we consider that a very high priority. Nipple pain, cracked, bleeding, sore nipples, which we'd like to avoid completely mm -hmm. and can be made avoidable by the perfect latch early on and early intervention, early assessment. We, we ask the doulas in the birth to please help us by getting the baby on correctly. We ask the labor and delivery nurses who are now all trained. It's a very important part of their training to make sure that first latch is really a good latch and that successive latches after that are done correctly. We are going to take a quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> Let's talk about positioning for a minute because this will lead us into the next issue, which is how do you get sore in the first place? Mothers should never lean to their babies. Babies always come to their mothers. I like to say to my patients and mommies all the time, Sit back, you're the queen. The mm -hmm. baby uh, never, the queen never leans to her prince or princess. The prince or princess always comes to the queen. So if the mom sits back and brings her baby up high, the baby's aligned properly, no reaching or leaning, the breasts don't move, and the baby actually gets lined up with the mother, not the opposite, because women will often try to move their breast to the baby. The baby actually comes to the mother. If we could line up the two puzzle pieces, we get a perfect locking clip right away. If they're off, just like anything else in the body, chiropractors know, if you're off, you're out. And mm -hmm. if you're not in good alignment, nothing's going to work right. You can't even mm -hmm. walk straight. So if the same thing applies for our newborns. If the baby's not aligned properly, they can't get a good latch, it's going to probably affect the mother more than the baby. But the baby is a participant. So if the baby's not latched on properly, they don't benefit from a good feeding either. So we have to make sure that both of them are aligned. We tell them shoulder and back support. Bring your baby up high. Maybe a step stool. Maybe a foot stool. Maybe a back pillow or support pillow. Something for the mother so she doesn't have to lean forward. And then bring Bring the baby up high. So we like the cross cradle hold or the crossover hold or the front hold, although a lot of hospital nurses and lactation support are teaching the football hold. It's easier for some moms in the beginning. Um, we typically like the baby across the body. It seems to work the best and gets the best alignment. But I will tell anybody what I will tell all the mothers, do what works at that time. We can always adjust as needed. If you start with a football hold, we could switch to a clutch hold later on. If you're starting with a cross cradle hold, we could switch to a cradle hold later on. Do what's working and what causes the least amount of discomfort early on. Random question. Does beer really help uh, with milk production? That's a great question, and beer actually does help. But really, more importantly, if the mothers would just eat the ingredients in the beer, uh -huh. they wouldn't have to have the alcohol. Hops and barley, oats and grains 
and brewer's yeast are essential for milk production. Okay. It just so happens that they all come in a beer. A near mm-hmm. beer would be fine with no alcohol, and an occasional drink is fine, oh, too. Oh, a near beer. Oh, and a beer. Because, I mean, with, between mm-hmm. the beer and the football, I thought it was an attempt to get dads and partners more That's involved. a very good way to get the dad involved. <laughs> football hold, we're going to yeah. have a beer. Come on. <laughs> yeah. You can do it. Should a mom a expect to be pumping in the hospital? A new mom? Mothers can pump in the hospital under certain circumstances. We may have to introduce a pump early. A good example would be things didn't go quite the way we planned and the baby and the mother are separated. So then we want to encourage support the mother as early as possible with starting her lactation history. So we would bring a pump to the room. In that case, the baby and the mother are separated. We need to mimic what breastfeeding would be if the mother can't get up to the nursery where the baby may be or the special care nursery. So a pump might be introduced to a mother early. Another example would be a mother who's complaining of discomfort with nursing and or if we're worried or concerned that we're not seeing a good transfer of colostrum in the early hours, we might bring a pump in the room and say, let's get the ball rolling a little bit better and quicker, faster, and then we'll bring the pump out. You won't need it anymore and possibly reintroduce it after you've gone home. Is there a specific type of pump that you think works better? I think we should talk a little bit about pumping. Sure. The Affordable Health Care Act allows for all women, every woman, to be afforded a breast pump. The insurance companies get to decide what level of pump you will be entitled to. The um, Also, the state provides, through WIC, uh, for our low-income indigent moms, a breast pump kit and sometimes even a breast pump to take home. Mothers can choose what pump would work for them, and pumping is an, an entire other podcast we're going to have to do. But we'll, let me explain we'll right now. And, well, we'll, yeah, we'll do one on pumping. Let's do one on, but let's talk about it now. I think it's important for women to pay attention to their long-term plan. If you think that there's a chance that you're going to go to work and you're going to leave your baby, you're going to want to think about pumping. And for that, you'll probably need an upgraded pump, not necessarily a hospital-grade pump, but certainly an upgraded pump that would allow for easy access, double pumping, fairly quick, you're at work, you only have a short break, and you have to get back to your desk or your job or whatever you're doing, driving, for example. And a lot of moms pump and drive now. So you'd want to find out from your insurance company what they're allowing you, what they'll provide, and then find out if they have an allowance. If you pay an additional $25, $50, $75, or $100, will they upgrade to next level pump? Some insurance companies will do that. Some say, no, this is the only pump we provide. Hmm. Then the parents get to decide if they want to go to Babies or Us, Toys or Us, Buy by Baby, Walmart, wherever, online, and buy an upgraded version of a pump. There are hand pumps for single use. There are little electric pumps that can be done singly or double. There are double pump equipments. Some of them now have conversion kits. So if you get one pump and then you change to another pump, you don't have to buy all new parts. You can buy a small conversion kit, very accessible. Some women want to rent a breast pump. That is also something that they might either do through their hospital, outpatient lactation center, retail store, and rent a pump temporarily until they've decided how they want to proceed. So I think rather than spending a lot of time worrying about Many other things, I ask mommies and daddies to pay attention to your plan. A home ho- a home mommy, a working mommy, pumping versus not pumping. Are there any absolute contraindications to, to breastfeeding? For example, medications that someone might have to take? I think that I defer oftentimes to the physicians to help me out with questions like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. There are times when breastfeeding is not a good fit. Uh, In cases where we have clients or mommies who are using medication that's not safe for breastfeeding, and those can come in a variety of categories, there seems to be a lot of talk. We'll have to have another podcast on marijuana use, Mm -hmm. um, on whether or not it's safe for breastfeeding mothers. Some psychotropic medications are not safe for breastfeeding. There are some chemotherapeutic medications. By the way, another podcast might be on cancer and Mm -hmm. women surviving cancer and breastfeeding, Um, women who are surrogates and carrying breast milk for another baby, the baby that they gave birth to, but they're not actually caring for, and things that they're doing in their own personal health history. There are some indications why a mother wouldn't or shouldn't be breastfeeding. Most of the time, most of the medications are safe, if they're discussed with the physician first, we generally will allow women to breastfeed even with some medications that might seem contraindicated but actually could be safe for nursing. Mm. For example, there are women who have postpartum depression or who have had a history of depression. They should not stop breastfeeding because there are safe medications to take with anxiety or depression that are not contraindicated for the breastfed baby. So I would defer to the doctor and ask the doctor to step in for us and help us figure out if this couplet 
and this medication choice is the right choice, or are there other options that they could continue to nurse for, or do we need to stop breastfeeding? Um, and that that would be, and then of course we have HIV positive, and whether or not those mothers should be breastfeeding. So there's a whole community of women who f- might fall into the it's probably not the best idea, versus yes, you could breastfeed, but we want you to be careful smoking cigarettes, mm-hmm. smoking marijuana, and or alcoholic beverages. And some having a beer is one thing, having a gla- a bottle of wine is another, mm-hmm. having multiple drinks is another. So we want to be careful to isolate out the incidents and speak specifically to that issue. Okay. I don't think we have an episode to date that's as information dense as this one so far. Um, And unfortunately, we're getting towards the end of it. We're out of time. But as you've already mentioned, there's a whole bunch more lactation um, and breastfeeding support topics that we can come back and do a whole episode on. Uh, Before we go, I do want to do two things. I want to ask both of the moms who are are just recently – uh, have recently had babies and breastfed. If you had a specific issue that came up for you um, during breastfeeding that um, you learned from or needed help with, um, and then at the end, I want to talk to Linda about the different type of lactation helpers there are in the community because there's not, they're not all the same, and and what they did do. I remember we specifically had bottle gate that occurred within bottle gate. Bottle gate. So our my daughter Ava. Uh, you know, we our intention to giving her the bottle was so that we could actually go out on a date night or actually leave her. I wasn't going back to work. Um, but she took the bottle well for about a week or two, and then all of a sudden she would not take it at all. And I remember calling Linda and saying, what is going on? Should we push through this? Should I just continue to exclusively breastfeed her? And, um, you know, we we, bas- we netted out at if we really want her to take the bottle, we have to be consistent with it. And there were nights where we would sit there for an hour or two hours and just sit there and Ava would cry, cry her eyes out, and we would make it through that bottle. But um, that was one of – I never knew uh, bottle gate could actually ever occur. So she took the bottle initially, but yes. then – and then sort of went on protest. Overnight protested and rejected it completely. Hmm. Is that common? It's actually one of the most common problems. People are told not to offer the baby too many bottles initially because they want to establish breastfeeding. And then parents want to date night or go to work or actually anything. And the baby's like, I don't actually want to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And it does happen. Breastfed babies may never take a bottle. Bottle-fed babies may never breastfeed, and there are babies who do both really well. And I'm not sure if starting earlier or waiting later is really going to make much of a difference. But here's what I do believe. I believe that what she just said, if your attitude is about it, it's going to happen. So we're going to actually get this baby to bottle feed. I'm definitely not a bottle feeding expert, but we're going to get the baby to bottle feed come hell or high water somehow. So sometimes I'll tell parents, let's give this a rest. We'll visit this again next week. Or why don't we try a different trick? Trick the baby. Make the baby think it's breastfeeding, but actually trick the bottle in there. Or come up with some other way to make it a little bit less offensive and not make the parents feel that they're trying to hurt their baby or torture their baby. We don't want any bad memories like a big dream of a bottle coming at me and whatever. (laughs) Ah! So I think it's important to know that that is actually real. But the good news is I've never seen and I hope I never see the Wall Street Journal front page saying the baby wouldn't take a bottle (laughs) and something happened, God forbid. So that's not going to happen. The truth is... We'll help them fetch their way through the first few weeks or months with bottle, without bottle, and we'll get everybody back to work or back to wherever they need to be so that they can be successful, whether it's switching to a cup early or having a grandma, grandpa help us or calling in a helper from the outside to get that baby conditioned back to whatever needs to be done so parents can resume their normal lives. But it is actually quite common, normal, and not something we want to stress out over too much. Bottlegate. I didn't know that's what it was called. I experienced that also, but I didn't. I gave up. He never used a bottle. It was a sippy, like a sippy. straw cup. That's right. Right to a cup. Uh, right oh, to a cup. Oh, he skipped the bottle face. He did not like bottles. We wow. were not bottle people, apparently. Hmm. But it has a name. <laughs> yeah. We must have ordered every know. bottle on Amazon. We did order every one. Every also. single one. <laughs> and it wasn't the bottle. I have a I whole... like to think that that's more of the child you got. And yeah. so now be prepared for all the things that come in life. Yeah. That's the child you got. <laughs> the one that he, says, he no, luck, no, no, no. Food. Yeah, he loves it. Yeah. Oh, thank goodness. And they like to hold their own cup. Yep. Exactly. So, yeah. That was my baby. Uh, and then my issue that I had was more um, I was had this time crunch to go back to school. So I only had four weeks and I had to make the best of that four weeks and establish a relationship. So I went to – I uh, had a lactation consultant and I went to her like private – a group with like six other women I love that. and I was there every week and I was like 
every position, hand, very strict, like, we're on this schedule. And I was like my own uh, breastfeeding Nazi lady myself because I was like, I need to breastfeed. I have four weeks. So I... A lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. a lot of pressure. Well, then I uh, had like a hyperlactation issue because... Is overproduction? Overproduction, yeah. So I... And my lactation consultant I knew didn't really... Well, it's a good thing. And I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> um, so I didn't really ever get really good help. I kind of researched like the block method and then I just pumped. But How I did tried you know you were overproducing? I had uh, – well, my – the baby's poops were kind of green, green. and frothy. Yeah. Mm. And I was like, this looks very strange. I'm pretty sure he didn't have matcha green tea. Uh-huh. So <laughs> that's what it looked like. And I was like, this is weird. And so I researched. I asked her and then she basically – didn't give me very good information. And so I was like, okay, so what do I do? So then I looked up different things about like blocking where you try like just emptying one side first, like every feeding, like the first two of the day, and then you switch over to the other side. And so that's what I did. I was just like, well, and that seemed to work. So then I would just pump and freeze things. So Mm -hmm. I had to get my own freezer. And I was a dairy farm. Mm. I had about 10 gallons of milk at a time. Mm -hmm. And I just... Uh, I ended up do- donating milk because I just had – you can only keep it for a certain time, even in a deep freezer. And so at that time, I just gave to the donation. Like there's a bunch of organizations you can give to. Yes. And that's what I did. It's wonderful. You know, I had a, a friend who I went to chiropractic school with who um, had a, a, an accident shortly after she gave birth and um, basically went into a, a vegetative state. Oh. And um, never recovered from it. But, uh, you know, at the beginning, we didn't know if she would or wouldn't recover. And um, it was really important to her. She had triplets. And it was really important to her that the triplets would get breast milk. And so I kind of, using social media, went out and said, does anybody have extra breast milk? And there were some women who just, once they heard the story, took it upon themselves that they were going to pump a little extra for for these babies. And on like every Thursday night, I'd drive around town in my car with a cooler. And um, one person in particular who stuck out in my mind, like every time I went, she had bags and bags of milk that she pumped specifically for these babies to donate them. Like, where are you getting all this milk from? (laughs) Yeah. It's just like cows in the backyard or uh, or whatever. And, you know, I know how precious, it, precious that milk is to people and how uh, it's like liquid platinum. Um, but it's kind of amazing that if you're able to overproduce, produce extra that you shared it with it's other. It's wonderful. We are so grateful for the women who have been so kind to share their milk with other mothers who you can't make enough milk or for whatever reason, they're anatomical, surgical, whatever, sick. And there certainly have that happens as well. Are so kind to give their milk and want to, and it's wonderful. And there are a lot of organizations now that are making an effort to bank milk and save milk and collect milk and store milk long term for women, so that their babies and the NICUs as well, the babies can get um, the precious breast milk. Before we end, tell me about the different type of lactation helpers that there are and what each one does. It's um, a, a, an important part of what we do is who and who we are is our training. So there are a lot of educators, a lot of lactation educators or women who go in or men even who go into the field. There's actually lactation consultants who are men as well. Mm-hmm. Make sure I include them uh, who go into the field to teach. They want to do education format. They want to do online classes or in person on um, one-on-one and or group classes. So there are lactation educators. That is their training. That is all they do, not hands-on. Then there are all the other people who do clinical support. There are some lactation educators who have a clinical training and can do hands-on. A lot of the doula training goes through a basic lactation, 16 to 18 or 20 hours or even more of lactation support. Then we level up to the lactation consultant. The lactation consultant has additional support, training, and guidance in a clinical setting And many of them are based in a baccalaureate degree education, not always, but a baccalaureate degree education in allied health, whether that's in in physical therapy or occupational therapy as their training. Nurses oftentimes go into this field. A lot of speech pathologists go into this field as well. And they take additional courses and training so that they can do clinical lactation support. And then there are the board-certified lactation consultants who have sat for their uh, boards, which are international boards, and have 
additional 900 hours of clinical time. Now, there are variations on the hours 300 to 900 is typical. If it's a registered nurse who happens to be in obstetrics, they may need a little less clinical hours. If it's someone out of the actual field in allied health, they may need a little more hours. So we, we ask our, our mommies and daddies to research who they're taking uh, their classes and support with and who's helping out in the hospital. Many, many hospitals now are requiring their staff on site to be board-certified lactation consultants. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's a great breakdown. And, and um, you can look up the different uh, sort of initials after the name uh, and, Correct. and tell who's who based right. on those initials. Um, all right. Time went very fast here. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank both of uh, Kristen and Anisha for being here and for sharing your personal experiences with us. And uh, Linda, for the wealth of information that you carry and the passion for what you do. Thank you. It's really special. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank Where can you. we find you online? MyNursingCoach.com. Mommies can um, tap in any time and ask questions. Uh, there's a box there that says ask a question. And um, they can find me driving around town. Wave to me if you see me around. <laughs> and my staff uh, driving around in our little Ford Transit Connects. There's flowers all over our truck. And if you're not obviously in this state and you can't see us, then uh, reach out. Please ask for help because really even the simplest question, uh, which seems like may not even be important, is so vital. And having moms get support and guidance is really critical to their long-term success. So anytime they can reach out. You can also reach us out on mommy, M-A-H-M-E-E dot com. Mommy dot com. Uh, and also if you're listening at home, there's a wealth more of information that you can get from Linda. Uh, just send us your questions to info at informedpregnancy.com. Thanks for listening. And if you like our program, share us with your friends, rate us, and leave a comment in your podcast app. And be sure to visit us online for lots more pregnancy and parenting media at informedpregnancy.com. <laughs>